Festival, our next speaker is going to be asking you the question, is sustainability something that we can keep? Our next speaker is Tom Munaki, and he will be here to speak about a wonderful background as to what's happening with our future. Tom. Um, first of all, I'm a neighbor of David Brin. He's one of my favorite intellectual sparring partners. A uh, very frustrating person to talk to because every time you come up with this neat idea, he says, well, I've already written a book about that. So uh, he's uh, quite an amazing character. And uh, so um, I was a uh, computer scientist and vice president at uh, SAIC for 18 years, and I designed hospital information systems for the Veterans Administration, the VISTA system, the VISTA system, and the Department of Defense Composite Healthcare System. Very large scale uh, hospital information systems. Turned 40 or so after that, and I started looking at what I was doing and was I really helping the world and uh, decided that the state of the healthcare system was such that anything I did to make it get better would just make it uh, get worse faster. And uh, so I started looking around for ways of getting out of this perversity and how do we escape the bind that healthcare is still in. And I found uh, complexity theory at uh, Santa Fe Institute, Stuart Kaufman, Murray Gilman, and I found the World Wide Web in the early days of there were 150 websites. So that kind of got me started. But asking questions like that is kind of a career-limiting move. So uh, about 10 years ago, I uh, decided to uh, um, quit and do something. My do something moment here was uh, in India. I was in India, and I saw this woman here with a doctor who uh, was trying to save her uh, uh, two-week-old baby that was uh, less than a kilo, kilo weight, premature. And uh, the woman was, was there. Her husband was on, sitting on a rock over here. And uh, um, anyway, she refused medical care for her baby because it was a girl. And uh, so I decided, you know, there's just something really wrong with that to, for this person to be degraded to that state. And it was below a, a depressed state. It was just subhuman. And that really got me thinking, what can I do to make the world a better place? And um, the, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that it was a systemic foundational issue. Uh, it wasn't that she didn't have enough money. My first impulse was, they're poor, we're rich, let's send money. Um, the, United, the developed countries have spent $1.5 trillion uh, for the develop, developing world, and uh, David Ellerman will be talking about this, but the, the net effect has not, not been positive, it's sometimes been negative, but uh, all the money and development energy that we put into the world, development hasn't gotten down there. Uh, so I started seeing similarities between what was going on in third world development, philanthropy, healthcare, and just about everywhere we turn where we're dealing with systems of transformation rather than transaction that we just don't know how to handle uh, what's working and how to do more of it. So I started a group called the Uplift Academy and uh, just to look at these problems and it's a uh, dialogue based uh, interactive thing. I discovered that I was off topic everywhere I went. so I. Uh, had to create my own workshops. So uh, David uh, Brin, Heather, uh, David Ellerman, uh, Jim Pinto, and John Smart have all been to some of my workshops that I've been holding. And I find it a really valuable way to have these uh, conversational dialogues rather than uh, podium lectures as such as I'm giving right now. But uh, so what I've been doing, I'm, I'm, I figure I'm about 10, 10 years into a 20-year uh, process here. But, uh, but uh, so, I guess the analogy, and I've seen this in a lot of the TED Talks that I like to talk about, is the difference between toasters and cats. So a toaster is a machine, it's, a, it's a, uh, an entity, you press the button, it works. If it breaks, if the toaster uh, cord breaks, you can put another cord on it and uh, the toaster is working again. So a toaster is equal to the sum of its parts and you can uh, predict exactly what a toaster is going to do. It's, it's a machine, it's a mechanical reactive machine. A cat's a different thing altogether. Uh, a cat, if the tail falls off and you try to put the tail back on, you're not going to necessarily have a better cat. In fact, the cat can work quite well without a toaster. A cat's an adaptive, resilient entity. Um, cats grow. They aren't built. You can't dissect a cat and put it back together again and have the whole cat anymore. So this difference between cats and toasters really represents this mechanical linear model and the adaptive, resilient model that we see in nature and cats. If you put 10 toasters in the room, you just add up all the toasters and, and the sum of all 10 toasters. 
put 10 cats in a room, you don't know if you're going to have 15 or 5 the next morning. But uh, So there's two different worlds. And so the, the, the boils it all down to is that we're facing all these cat-like problems in the world, but we're using toaster-like thinking. And uh, this, is, this is, I think, at the core of what's happening here. And we can talk later. But healthcare is a cat-like problem. Uh, people have the placebo effect. They have uh, a self-perception of what's going on and everything. And you can't sit there and say, well, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll, you'll have help. And we can't say, well, uh, the, your health is the sum of the things that your doctor did to you this month. So if you got a tonsillectomy, an appendectomy, and a shot of penicillin, <laughs> did you get your 100% of your health care that month or not? Well, no. Um, so you can't, you can't take this toaster-like linearity or mechanical model and apply it to cat-like problems. And one of the contentions I have is that we don't have a model for understanding these adaptive things, the, which I'll call the flourishing model. We don't have a way of understanding what flourishing is all we have is the way of, of fighting what's, what's broken. So the World Wide Web, I think, is an example, a very recent example, of, of this flourishing model I want to talk about. So Tim Berners-Lee um, was one of my uh, first contacts when I got out of the uh, uh, healthcare field. And there was 150 websites in the world, 19 whatever. And we'd get an email, oh, there's a new website out there, 151, you know, 152. But um, if I can quote that, is that he said that what's difficult for people to understand about the web was that there was nothing else beyond URLs, HTTP, and HTML. There was no central computer controlling the web, no single network on which these protocols worked, not even an organization that ran the web. The web was not a physical thing that existed in a certain place. It was a space within which information could exist. So this is a really profound statement of what he did to create the web. Uh, URLs, HTTP, and HTML are not rocket science. Uh, a beginning computer science student could figure that out. Um, and uh, what he did, though, is he created something that was good enough to get started and evolve. So what he did here was with the, uh, the basic <laughs> initial conditions here, uh, URL, HTTP. So he started with these things. He constrained it to the internet protocol. So at the time, we had a lot of other internet-like uh, activities out there, CompuServe, uh, Prodigy, AOL. All were very powerful uh, groups at the time, and they would have loved to have you know, Tim's web be on AOL or whatever. But he took this perverse notion of putting it out on the internet protocol so it would be open. So the constraint that the web was going to be open is what made it open. So you know, good neighbors make good friends. Good fences make good neighbors, there we go. So these constraints on what he put on the web was a very powerful part of allowing it to flow and evolve. So then we started out with the first websites. He created this chaotic mess of websites. There was no structure, no order. Uh, he didn't have sites 1 through 100 being physics and 101 to uh, 1,000 being chemistry or whatever. So he allowed this chaotic mess to get started. And suddenly, people said, hey, we've got to organize this. So Yahoo got started. And then Google appeared. And the web figured out for itself how to organize this chaotic structure. Uh, very, very profound. It was simple. He just it, he, he created the infra infrastructure, and it took off on its own through this uh, autocatalytic space, I call it. The space fueled itself. So Amazon, for example, came along and uh, used up Amazon.com. That's the only part of the web that it actually used. and. Uh, uh, if Barnes & Noble goes into a bookstore, it uses up the space. Starbucks can't use that space for coffee. Amazon comes into space uh, and does its thing, but B Barnes & Noble can be beside of it. They don't use up the space. They actually make it bigger. So the more sites it got on the web, the bigger it got, and it fueled its own growth. So this is a, a phenomenally powerful uh, dynamic that we need to look for for looking at how we might see a flourishing future. Alcoholics Anonymous is another very interesting organization. It's 70 some odd years old. Uh, John D. Rockefeller got the proposal for the original thing, and he said uh, too much money could spoil this thing. So he actually underfunded AA, and if you go to their website, they talk about the fact that they were underfunded as one of their secrets of success. So it's a self-organizing, viral, self-help organization. The, the, the alcoholics help themselves, and uh, the more you 
more members you have, the more they can serve each other. They have a mentor structure, and it's a viral structure. Uh, the basic principle, it, it, it's got it's, uh, a certain set of uh, initial conditions, and it's capable of evolving, so AA has become uh, narcotics, anonymous, and all kinds of other uh, addiction-based activities. It doesn't have any cost, records, transactions, or identity to maintain. It's anonymous. Uh, contrast this with the current healthcare system. What are the first thing you need to do? You need to have an electronic medical record. You have to have transactions. You have to have all these structures. So AA has fueled its growth through this person-to-person -person viral growth structure, not through a hierarchy saying we have these uh, deficits that we need to deal with. So I think that the, the moral of the story here is to look for a flourishing future being this positive viral self-replicating model such as the web or AA, but the good things creating more of the, the good things. To do that, you have to escape from the current trend that says, oh, we have too many problems and not enough money. So you go to any kind of a philanthropic thing and says, well, what's your problem? How much is it going to cost to fix it? Well, how much does it cost to fix alcoholism for AA? Uh, the, 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 the cost was getting the infrastructure in there and lighting the match and letting it go. It wasn't saying, oh, each match and each flame is going to cost $43. So this, this whole transactional model of trying to break your problems into transactions that are going to cost you something that you can't afford to do more of is uh, one of the, the key areas here. So if you flip this question from too many problems, not enough money, to how do you get 6 billion people to help each other help themselves, you have a whole different dynamic and what you set up the system differently, and it looks more like setting up this web that the more people pile on, the bigger it gets, and the better it gets. So uh, David uh, Ellerman's book uh, called Helping People Help Themselves, uh, maybe he'll be talking about that later. And this is also this notion of being past bound. I think David talked about this also, being bound to the past and restricting your, your vision to what are the problems we need to fix. So we got this broken toaster, we need to fix it. Oh, well, let's put another tail on it or another uh, cord when in reality it's a cat and you, you, you can't put the tail back on the cat. But uh, how do you have a positive future to look forward to rather than the negative past that you're fighting your way from? Uh, the other one is this creating this network effect. That's kind of what fueled the dot-com boom. And uh, the, the more people, the, the first person who owned a fax machine had no value for it. The second person, suddenly they can talk. The third person, everybody bought a new fax machine, created value for everybody else. So that's the network effect. So the idea of, of building this, what's called a, a large-scale fine-grain network of scalable small things. What's the little thing that you can do a whole lot of through this network effect? What can you communicate easily? What are the little things that can happen and create this kind of a tipping effect to create the, the web-like uh, uh, explosion of activities? So this positive flip, uh, reframing things in terms of the positive future you're looking for uh, is, is, is very, uh, very uh, powerful. Uh, there's a whole field called positive psychology. Martin Seligman is uh, active in this. Uh, appreciative inquiry, that's kind of what got me started in it. David Cooper, writer at Case Western, asking the positive, uh, life-affirming questions of an organization that you want to have answered instead of what are your problems, how are we going to fix it? So uh, some of the building blocks that I've been looking at and we've been talking at through our Uplift Academy is positive psychology. Jonathan Haidt at uh, University of Virginia wrote a, uh, an article about the emotion of elevation. He got his PhD studying disgust, and he'd you know, take a cockroach and dip it in orange juice and pretend to drink it, and people's stomach would turn. And uh, it's a physical behavior, and maybe some of you have your stomach turned just now. The emotion of elevation, he said, is there a positive flip to disgust? It turns out it was elevation, and he showed people pictures of Mother Teresa or whatever, and they had this heartwarming sensation, the, 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 you know, uh, uh, pitter-patter in the heart, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart type thing. And it actually was this emotional called elevation of, of people's response in the heart and the certain warmth in the chest or whatever. He called that elevation. He also found that this was contagious. If you're around elevated emotional people, you feel elevated, yeah, which is, you know, duh, but this is a scientist telling us this now. And uh, this is a, a, a viral quality that, that positive uh, thinking, pe uh, people with positive emotions spread those emotions elsewhere. James Fowler, a researcher here at UCSD, just wrote a book called Connected, and he talked about happiness is contagious. And he found that through the Framingham Heart Data Study, a 40-year study of, of longitudinal study of, of patients, that 
the happy people spread their happiness through their social networks more than the depressed people. So this is another one of these little scalable small things that happiness is contagious through a network. And this is the first I've actually seen this uh, proven and uh, right down the street here at uh, UCSD. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran's speech, who didn't happen before me, has a thing called empathy mirror neurons. He also calls it the Gandhi mirror neuron. But he's saying if you're around somebody, uh, you have this, this uh, mirror neuron effect. It actually goes uh, uh, neurobiologically and you have this empathy reaction in the brain. Uh, but that's also fascinating. He said something like, mirror neurons will be to psychology what DNA is to biology. But he's got some very interesting ideas and concepts about how the brain actually reacts. Getting people in a face-to-face -face conversation and reacting to each other could also trigger this uplift cascade, I call it out. Uh, global connectivity, obviously that's everywhere. Uh, network effects. The whole notion of searching for something and amplifying the positive that you find as opposed to planning what you think you're going to need and then executing that plan. Two dichotomous ways of looking at the world. Uh, if you're doing a polio vaccination program, yes, you need to plan it and execute it. But if you're looking how to develop a country, maybe you should ask people what's working in your uh, community. So this discovery model as opposed to a planning model. And it's a little bit like Google being able to search for something instead of going to a card catalog and trying to f find something that somebody has organized for you in advance. So this search model, the dynamic network effects of finding things as opposed to having the UN decide on how the world is going to be. Um, and I think that's the end of my talk, one minute. <laughs> um, so anyway, I have a group called the Uplift Academy. I have uh, salons in my home. Uh, I'd love to have people that are into this topic. Uh, I'd love to connect with them. I'll probably be doing another one in Italy in the, the fall. Uh, we call them the Good Ancestor Principles. That's a Jonas Salk term. Jonas Salk is one of my heroes. Uh, uh, he seems to have been everywhere I've been intellectually uh, quite a bit earlier. But he, is, he asked the question, uh, the most important thing we can ask ourselves is, are we being good ancestors? And I think that kind of encapsulates uh, uh, how we should be looking at the forward. So thank you very much.